All right, so if uh, you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in two different places. Keep a finger there in Philippians chapter 3, uh, and, uh, or put your little the, the ribbon in your Bible there, uh, and then turn over to Ezra chapter 9. Uh, Philippians 3 should sound familiar to you. You think, well, that, that, that's, one of, uh, that's a verse that we kind of go back to uh, quite a bit. And you're absolutely right. We're going to be looking not only at uh, verse 12, but we're going to start that. Or we're going to skip down to verse 18 and following and talk about uh, some comparisons that Paul makes uh, to, uh, to God's people and others. Uh, but first, we're going to sit here in Ezra chapter 9 for a second and, and just kind of lay the groundwork for this idea of, of who do we think we are. Because honestly, that will determine what we do on a, not only on a, a, a daily basis, but a, uh, a minute by minute, action by action basis. Depending on our idea of, or our, you know, the definition of who we are as individuals, how we see ourselves will determine how we act. And how we act is important. Not because, like I've said, not because we're, we're gaining favor with God or that we're, uh, you know, somehow, uh, you know, we, we've got this, this big celestial scoreboard and we're keeping, uh, you know, uh, points for and points against or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, kudos and demerits or whatever. It's not that there's a big score. It's that how we act is a reflection of the amount of or the, the, you know, how far we are along this road of transformation. The way that we perform on a daily basis, on a minute by minute basis, our actions, our, our thoughts, our, our desires, all of that is determined by how much we are transformed by God. How, you know, Jesus would say how much you love God. And so our, our love of God, our desire to be with God, our, our uh, willingness to be transformed is, is, is directly reflected in, in how we act. And, and, and that's all about who, who we are. So if, we're, if, we, if we think that we are no good scoundrels, guess how we're going to act? We're going to act like no good scoundrels. I mean, if, if we think that we are unworthy of being loved, guess how we're going to act? We're going to act unworthy of being loved. If we have a very low opinion of, of ourselves, then it's not going to be hard for us to, uh, to get talked into participating in self-destructive behaviors. And so... Who you think you are is important. If I'm not worth very much, then I won't take very good care of myself. Case in point, many of you guys, uh, have, and I appreciate so much the calls and checking on me. Uh, a lot of y'all know that uh, this week, driving along in my, uh, in my old truck, and all of a sudden, I'm going 45 miles an hour on I-70, headed, uh, uh, headed back towards Wentzville. I'm just driving along like a normal person, front of the truck facing forward, back of the truck facing backwards, just like everything's supposed to be, right? Driving, driving, driving. All of a sudden, the back of the truck decided, ah, I want to be in the front for a little while. So it did that, and I'm, you know, I'm steering it. I'm waiting for Jesus to take the wheel. And, you know, apparently he did. I was unaware. He and I were fighting over it. Um, so I'm steering this way, and that worked for a minute. And then it decided that, no, we're going to go this way again. So I did that, and then 45 miles an hour right into the concrete barrier. Boom, old green's dead, right? Well, the good news is I was not hurt, except for I skinned my noggin a little bit. And um, I was not hurt. We got the truck off the road. It, if you would like to see it, it's in the parking lot right now. I'm trying to figure out what to do with it. Um, but then I went to this really cool place where they have all these other trucks that aren't wrecked. And they'll let you drive one if you pay them. So I did that. And now I have a newer truck. Well, 
Vic and I went to Nashville this uh, Friday to watch uh, Hayden in a competition, uh, in the jiu-jitsu competition, which he did very well in. And it took us longer to get there than the normal. We drove my newish truck. And you know why it took us longer to get there? Well, for one, 10 and 2, speed limit. But we had to stop to eat because we're not eating in the truck. We're, no, we're not. We're, we're not eating in, in, the, in the truck. We're just not. And, and uh, you know, you keep your feet on it. No, you know, Vic likes to recline and all that and the feet up on the. No, 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 no. Feet on the floor. Now, the green truck never one time saw a car wash. I vacuumed it out barely, but it was just an old beat up truck smelled weird on the inside the heat didn't work the air didn't work the windshield wipers had one speed either on or nothing uh the weather stripping was coming off in most places so it sounded like a wind tunnel in there uh there was a lot of dog hair from my dog and others uh it's just you know wasn't worth a whole lot The blue book value of this truck fluctuated with how much gas is in it, all right? Um, So I didn't take very good care of it. Yeah, I changed the oil. Well, I didn't really change the oil. It just sort of burned oil as it went. I just kept adding it. I changed the oil filter, you know. But I didn't really take good care of it. You know why? Eh, it wasn't worth that much. But now this one, I promise you, a lot better care of it. Now... That's a, a silly analogy about a, about a, a, a possession that in the end of, at, at the end of the day really is meaningless. But that's how we treat ourselves. Anybody who's, who's ever struggled uh, with relationship issues or addiction or anything know firsthand that if you don't think a lot of you, I can talk you into anything. I've been down that road. I've been down that, that same road, not only not caring a whole, you know, hill of beans about a truck, but not caring a whole bunch about me. And, and we, we've got to change that. We've got to allow God to change that so that we know our worth and our identity and all so that the, and our, our actions and our attitude towards ourselves will reflect that. Not so that we earn God's favor, but so that we live our best life. Because I'll tell you this, regardless of your circumstances, understanding who we are in Christ changes everything. And I'm able to take the good with the bad without my behavior going haywire. I'm able to to absorb some some chaos without uh, bad behavior following along. I'm able to then uh, turn away from some temptations. I'm I'm able for these these desires, these earthly carnal desires to come just flooding at me. And and I can say, you know, no thank you. Because I'm, I'm worth more than that. Because I don't, I, I don't need to partake in that in order to feel a certain something of myself. Because I, I'm, I'm on a different path here. So who you think you are is important. But let's not get carried away with that. Look at what, Ez, look at what Ezra's dealing with. Hold on a second. I was all smudgy. Um, in Ezra 9... We have a situation where bad news is coming to Edra, Ezra. And, uh, um, and, we're, and so we're reading, we're reading Ezra's diary here. But Ezra's a guy, so it's his journal, okay? Um, after these things uh, are done, the leaders came and said, the people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices like those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, Jebusites, Amorites, or Ammonites, Moabites, uh, Egyptians, and Amorites. They've taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves, and their sons have mingled the holy race with other, 
with, with peoples around them. And the leaders and officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. Now, let me just stop for a second and say, this is not about uh, interracial marriages or interracial anything. It's not, it's, it has nothing to do with races as we understand races. It, what it's talking about is, is different tribes that are, that are not Israelites, that are not God's people. And so as they are marrying in, those are treaties between families saying, uh, you know, hey, you know, we'll, we'll intermarry with you so that you won't fight against us. And so maybe we'll combine our financial resources and, and we'll be all taken care of. Because, and basically what it is, it's a lack of faith in God to take care of them or, or to defend them. So we have to make these treaties with other people. And that's, that's what those marriages represent. That's part of the downfall of Solomon. All of those wives, all of those concubines, what those, each one of those were treaties with another family, another tribe, another this or that, is that, hey, you know, we'll, we'll commingle these families so that we can help take care of one another and so that we can, uh, uh, you know, you, you won't attack us because we're really not sure, you know, how this God showing up thing works. So it has nothing to do with, with uh, race as we think about it. It has everything to do with, with not trusting God to take care of you. And, and so they're, they're going outside of the plan of God. They're going outside of the will of God to, uh, to secure their, their well-being. And look at what Ezra, when, when I heard this, I tore my tunic and my cloak. I pulled hair from my head and my beard, and I sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles. And I, I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. So biblically, that's, that's about six hours. He sits in, in, uh, in, in dust and ashes and ripped and, he, and he, he pulls hair out of his head and out of his beard. And, and so, you know, there's no doubt he's sitting there, you know, bleeding and, and, and uncomfortable and in pain and, and, and embarrassed because, you know, that's what the whole ripping, exposing, ripping the tunic, ripping the, the, the cloak, all that is, is just a, a, a complete and total debasement of self because of, because of of the sin, the lack of faith uh, that, that's going throughout God's people. And I think to myself, why is Ezra so upset about all this? And then I realize that Ezra gets it. Ezra understands. At no point here do you read at all that, the, that no point does the Bible ever say that Ezra was part of the sinning. That Ezra was doing anything, anything at all wrong. But when, when he gets news of God's people not doing what God has called them to do, it, it breaks his heart so much that, that he, he rips his clothes and pulls hair from his head. And he sits there appalled and, and repentant on behalf of those who were involved. You see, Ezra gets it because it's no shock when lost people... Act like they're lost. There's a, there's a real good reason why lost people act lost. Bill, why, why do you think lost people act lost? Because they're lost. They're lost. Lost people act like they're lost because they're lost. The problem isn't when lost people act lost. The problem is when God's people act lost. When God's people aren't the, 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 the absolute pillars of faith depending on God. When, when God's people aren't the ones who are uh, overcoming circumstances uh, with faith. The, the problem is when God's people act like they're not God's people. And so this gets us to Philippians chapter 3. Oh, and I pull my ribbon out. Philippians chapter 3. And I've preached this sermon so many times. I've preached this, not this sermon, but I've preached this passage so many times. And, and, and I, I, I tried so hard to go away from it this week. Because there's other places where it talks about as we are, you know, brings this idea of unity and, and, and uh, uh, act, you know, in our actions and, and who we are together. But, but 
but this passage just, just sums up so much. And, I, and so I want us to understand this maybe from a, from a different angle than we, than we have in the past. So I, as I've read before, you know, Paul says, not that I've already obtained it or been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus took hold of me and move on down to, to verse 15. He says, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. What, what view is that? The view that I'm going to press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will, will, will make clear for you. Only let us live up to what has already been obtained. Join with others in following my example. Take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. And here's the, where it starts, the, this passage that is encouraging and haunting and teaching. For as I've often told you before and now again even say with tears that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. One thing that Paul is telling us is that so much, so much of what we of what we learn, so much of what we hear, so much of what we read and what we sing and what we pray, so much of, the, uh, of what God wants us to hear bears repeating. It's easy for us to, uh, uh, to get bored with, with, with Scripture at times. And as we read through, and I find myself doing this, is that when I read through and, I, and it's something that I'm super familiar with, and I can almost quote, I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yada, yada, yada. I mean, I will yada, yada, yada uh, passages like nobody's business. And, and I probably ought to not do that. Something's bear repeating. There, there, is, a, there is a reality uh, of, of God that we should over and over and over again. I mean, things like, uh, you know, the, just God loves you. I mean, how many times have you heard that? But then how many times more do you need to hear that? I mean, the most simplest of things, the most uh, basic of all spiritual premise in, the, in Scripture is that God loves us. I mean, for God so loved the world that he gave his own, only son that whosoever, see, I almost yada yada right through that one. But just that very basic foundational premise of the word of God that God loves us. If we just repeated that over and over and over again all day long, how would your day be different? Paul says some things bear repeating. We need to hear this over and over again. And then there's this urgency that he says, I, I, you know, and now with tears, I'm telling you this, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And you say to yourself, or you say, yeah, Shane, we get it. I watch the news. I see what's going on in the world. I see all the evil and the division and all of this. And, and, and I get it. There's a lot of bad people out there. And my message to the church this morning is we're not talking about them. does us no good to wring our hands over the lost people out there acting lost until we are willing to wring our hands over the, the, the saved people who on a daily basis act lost. Who are chasing the same things that those outside of Christ who have no hope those who, who don't know the, the saving, redemptive reality of Jesus Christ, who have no hope, we're chasing the same things that they're chasing. And, and how do I know that? Because our lives look exactly the same. We can drive down our streets and look at homes where families live with cars in the garage neatly manicured lawns and you can't tell the difference between somebody who is in a passionate relentless relationship with jesus christ and those who aren't you can talk face to face with you can go to work with people you can live next door to them you can be right and and, and so often times if someone from the outside looking in couldn't tell the difference between somebody who's just a, a, a good citizen and somebody who is a, a passionate Christ follower. Because honestly, in the church in America, the passionate part sometimes left off. 
the question that we ask ourselves is, who do we think we are? Because so often we, we take passages like this and we feel good about ourselves because it's easy to turn the lens outside of these walls and to say, you know what, yeah, look at all those people. Look at them with their this and their lifestyles and, their, uh, and, and just all that going on. But that's, that, that is of, a, of no consequence to us. What we have to be looking at is, is are we living the life? Are we gr- passionately pursuing, trying to grab a hold of, of what Christ has grabbed a hold of us for? Because a lot of times we think we're the, we're the morality or the, the, uh, we're the behavior police. You know, it's up to us to let everybody else know what all that they're doing wrong. And what God is calling us to do is, is to take a look internal and, and, and not internal in here and say, you know what? You know, yeah, you're right, Shane. Uh, you know, read us. He really needs to get his act together. You know, or, or you know, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and, and somebody needs to do something about these kids over here doing it. No. What, what, who do I not who do I think Bill is, or who do, who, you know, who do I think, any, it's who do I think I am? He says, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ, and we like to make that, you know, Al-Qaeda, or, or you know, Hitler, or whatever, you know, who, you know insert, you know, North Korea, whatever. We, we like to make that other, but what he's saying is that those inside the body of Christ often act like they are enemies of that same body because of the way that they act. Or the way that they don't act. And he goes on to describe them. He says uh, that uh, their, their God is their stomach. Uh, he, he said, I've often told you, you know, they're, they're uh, enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. It's all summed up in that last thing. Their mind is on earthly things. When you see the church pursuing everything that those outside of the church pursue when we pursue comfort when we pursue uh status when we pursue riches when we pursue popularity when we pursue power all of the same things that those outside of the body of christ are consumed with when our lives are the very same thing when we're pursuing all of that we're no different pulling the hair out hair out ripping the clothes that, that's, what Ezra, that's what Ezra is experiencing. That's what Paul is, is warning the Philippians about. He says, easy, easy guys. There, there's so many that, that th- think one thing and do another. And then he comes up with this. I, I love this. After he says, look, their, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. You know, all of those things. He says, look, it, they're... The, the, the urgency part comes with the fact that, that there is a destiny here that, that cannot be changed. It can be our, our, our uh, the road that we are on can, but the, the end result of whatever that road is, that, that's, that's set in stone, guys. If you get on I-70 and you start heading west, yeah, that's what, if you start heading west on I-70, you're going to hit Kansas City at some point. It's, it's already predetermined that that's what's in, that's what's that direction. You keep going, you're going to hit Denver. If you even keep going from that, you're, you're going to run into the ocean at some point. And no matter how much you want that direction, no matter how comfortable that road is, no matter how nice it is, no matter how many other people that you know that look like you, talk like you, act like you, smell like you, work like you, have, no matter how many people are just like you, if you want the, the destiny of that road to be something else, it doesn't matter. Because that, that's, that's where that heads. That's where that ends up. He says, look, that it, it, it's, there's no amount of want to that's going to change that. There's no amount of, uh, of well, well, he's here and she's there. And no, no amount of any of that's going to change that. He says, there, there, there's a destination and it's bad. 
Their God is their stomach. They're, they're, they're just following whatever carnal, physical desire. I want to do this, so I'm going to. It's like, you know, I was having a, a, a conversation with my daughter um, this week, and I know that doesn't narrow it down very much, but it would, I was having a, a conversation with, it says, you know, what we want to do is, is and what we feel um, obliged to do so often, what we feel that well within our rights to do so often it is not what we need to do. You know, there, we have desires all the time. We, we run into situations all the time where, where we want to do a certain thing. And, and that's not what God has called us to do. If someone's rude to me, guess what I want to do back? I want to be rude back. If someone is, is mean to me, guess what I want to do? I want to be mean to them back. If somebody you know, treats me a certain way, I want to mirror that behavior. God said, well, you know what? That, that's, that's maybe what feels comfortable. But that's, that's not what I want. I want you to love your enemies. I want you to be kind to those who persecute you. You know, I, I really want to say something about this person to, to hurt them. But Jesus says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Only that which is beneficial in building up those who hear. You know, that's a passage that if, we, if the church got that one right, it'd change the world tomorrow. Change the world tomorrow. You know, man, I really, I really wanted to give them a piece. Of, I really wanted to tell them about what they were... It, it, let no one wholesome talk come out of your mouth. I, I mean, there's so many times where we just, we pursue comfort. Our, our God, what we serve, what we worship is our stomach, what's comfortable, what satiates our own carnal desires. And their glory is in their shame. If I can look around and, and other people are doing what I'm doing, then I feel okay. I mean, if, if, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm chasing after this materialistic world, but, but you know, uh, uh, other people are doing the same, so I'm, I'm in good company, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. And then verse 20 happens. And I love this. He says, but our. You hear that? but our because you know what we're different we're not like other people we're different and you know how we're different the very next word but our citizenship is in heaven and that's an important word not only for paul because he was a roman citizen and so, and that was a big deal. And, and the Philippians, their citizenship was a very big deal. It's a whole lot like now where we, our citizenship is a big, fat deal, isn't it? I mean, if you're anywhere in the world and, and people start acting, you know, treating you some kind of way or whatever, you're like, hey, what's the first thing you buy? Hey, I'm an American. I'm an American. Now, you can't do this to me. I, I'm the, I'm the this. I, you know, our citizenship means something. And we act accordingly, don't we? I, I mean, you know, the, you start saying, you know, the, and you know, Vic and I on the drive home, we had a long conversation about, you know, about this and the, you know, the whole political climate and citizenship and my rights and all that kind of stuff. That's a big deal to us. And we act a certain way because of our citizenship, don't we? I mean, there might be some entitlement there. There might be some, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. I mean, you know, you think about the, the rights that we're willing to fight for. Whether it's the Second Amendment right or the First Amendment right or the this right or that. And I struggle with this. I, I struggle in my own heart, my own mind with this. Because there are things about my citizenship that, that I, I think I'm willing to fight for. That, that I think I'm willing to be... That, that I think I'm willing to sacrifice for. That maybe, maybe I need to rethink those things. Maybe I need to take a, another look at, at what, what citizenship is really 
really worth my life or the life of my wife and children? I mean, it's, it's no secret. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge Second Amendment guy, right? I mean, I talk, I love shooting, I love hunting, I love all those things. And, and you know, what if, what if that gets removed? Then what? You know, am I just stomping around and just going go to go to war and, and I'm going to take to the streets and I'm going to pick at this and, and I'm going to do all that. I'm going I'm to fight for those rights or is my citizenship in heaven where none of my earthly rights matter because I've got one right and that is the right as a son of God and that is all that matters. Do I, am I willing to live like that? The answer is I don't know yet. I don't know yet. Because I'm still real hung up on fighting for my rights on this piece of dirt. That, that's where our divisiveness comes from in, in this country right now. Because we can't, you, you can't unify around anything but this. That's it. Oh, the Constitution is a miracle of, you know, it's a living, do- you know what's a living document? <laughs> You know, what's the only, I mean, that's what we're talking about. Who do we think we are? Am I an American citizen? Am I, am I a citizen of the, of the greatest nation in the history of the world? Or am I a citizen of the only true everlasting kingdom of Jehovah God? I don't know. I know what I want to be, but I know that, that how I define myself. I struggle. And I'm just being honest because I think we all struggle. I think we all struggle because I I, I, want to be comfortable. I mean, you know, I just got a car with heat in it. I just want to be comfortable. I I really do. I just I just want to be I want life to be. But then I you know what I read so much about is that, you know, I'm I'm willing to do whatever Christ has called me to do to, and I I invite his suffering. No, we don't, Bill. We don't invite it. Rich, we don't invite his suffering, do we? We do everything we can do uh, to to avoid that kind of thing. We we do whatever we can to avoid that. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. See, I love this, that he's speaking in kingdom language. Present tense. It's not just about later, it's about now. He's saying, don't get too comfortable. Don't don't try to make treaties. Don't try to make peace. Don't don't try to to, to blend in. Because your citizenship is in heaven. So who do we think we are this morning? Do we think we are uh, Americans? Do we think that we are are, are uh, white people or black people or, or brown people? or the, Do we think that we're Republicans or Democrats? Do we think that we're conservatives or liberal? Do we think, I, I mean, do we think that we are, are uh, uh, you know, Church of Christ or insert whatever definition here? Or are we citizens of God's kingdom? Because if we are, we will act accordingly. If we are, we will love accordingly. And unfortunately for us, we will suffer accordingly. But even in suffering, even in suffering, there is there is glory, there is peace, there is joy. There, there are all the things that God promises. So my question is, can we live distinctive lives? Can we stop trying to put wall-to-wall carpet and leather seats and surround sounds in the coffins that we live in, drive around? And can we, 
stop trying to make ourselves comfortable and at home in a place where we don't belong? Can we live distinctive kingdom lives that God is ready to grant us citizenship into? Who do you think you are this morning? We're going to sing a song. What's our last song that we're singing? We're going to sing uh, Restore My Soul, and then I Am Crucified with Christ, and then uh, we're going to pray together, and then we'll be dismissed, and we'll go and and uh, we'll have a question to ask. We have a, a, a question to ask ourselves. What's life going to look like going forward? Now that I know what I know, now that I, uh, you know, now that I can see what I can see, what is life going to look like the rest of today and tomorrow and going into this week? Who do you think you are? Let's, together, let's stand and sing.